She didn't come up. She didn't listen. No, no. She hasn't talked at all. Good afternoon, Francis. Good afternoon, Kevin. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us for this update with regard to the state's response on the pandemic. And we're gonna to focus today just on the pandemic and talk about three things we're doing to address it. Uh, first of all, let's uh, take a step back. As always, I wanna remind people that we still have the pandemic, there's still the virus around. It's still important that you wear that mask, that you wash your hands, and that you maintain that six foot of distance between you and other people. And we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about that. And remember, all the steps we've taken, all, all the restrictions we put in place have been to preserve our hospital capacity. And so right now we are at 30% of hospital beds, 29% of ICU beds, and 77% of our ventilators. Now, one of the things we have seen is we have seen an increasing number of hospitalizations. As of last night, we had 323 people in the hospital, which is nearly 40% more than when we had our peak hospitalizations back in May. And while we have seen increasing testing and increasing cases, again, what I've really focused on is those hospitalizations. And again, all the restrictions we put in place has really been about trying to make sure we maintain that hospital capacity, that we can provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, and that ventilator to anybody who needs it when they need it. Now, it's pained me to put in place these restrictions on people's personal liberty and for government to tell businesses how they have to run, but it's been necessary to be able to preserve that hospital capacity. And as we look at these increasing hospitalizations, we're going to take three, we're going to talk about three different efforts today to be able to address that. And the first has to do with changing our DHM, our directed health measure. We're going to be making some changes on that to be able to help address maintaining that hospital capacity. Now folks, I know everybody is tired of the pandemic. They're tired of wearing masks, and avoiding uh, you know, large crowds, they wanna be with people, they wanna be with family, but we still have the virus in our community. And as these increasing number of hospitalizations demonstrate that it is, in some cases, spreading very widely. So as we look at the contact tracing data, what we see is that, and talking to our public health department folks, is that we see that a lot of the spread is coming from informal gatherings. They're coming from gatherings of people's homes, maybe friends on a Friday night, or having family over for a get together. So they're informal type gatherings. It's important to remember, just because you know somebody doesn't mean they can't give it to you. If you know somebody, they can still give you the virus. The virus has spread from one person to another. So we have to be able to slow this stuff down. And so today we've got a number of speakers to be able to, to talk about what we've got going on. Uh, we've got Dr. James Lawler, who's the Associate Professor of Infectious Disease at University of Nebraska Medical Center. He's gonna talk a little about some of the data like these charts, the charts you're seeing over here. Dr. Antone is gonna to talk to us about a program we're gonna have for the hospitals with regard to staffing. We've got Gina Ewing, who's the director of the Log uh, Elkhorn Valley Logan, uh, Elkhorn, sorry, Elkhorn Logan Valley uh, Public Health Department. She's the director there. She's gonna be talking about uh, what they're seeing from the Public Health Department. And then we're gonna have Matt Bloomstead, who's gonna be, uh, who's the Commissioner of Education, talking about schools. And the three topics will broadly be our changes to our DHM, a program we have for staffing with regard to our hospitals, and then our communications program around, again, renewed emphasis on practicing our tools to slow down the spread of the virus. So let me start with the first one, with regard to our, our directed health measures. We're going to make several changes to our directed health measure that will be effective on Wednesday, October 21st. The first is that we are going to be putting in a stipulation in the DHM that hospitals will have to maintain 10% of their staffed hospital beds and staffed ICU beds 
to be able to, as a cushion, to be able to handle coronavirus patients if they want to do elective surgeries. So that's a requirement that if you're doing elective surgeries, you keep a 10% cushion on your hospital, staffed hospital beds and staffed ICU beds to be able to accommodate new coronavirus patients coming in. You will not be allowed to transfer patients if you want to do elective surgery. So, for example, if you transfer patients to try and get that 10% cushion, that is not going to count for you, uh, your ability to be able to do those elective surgeries. So that's the first piece, first change. The second has to do with indoor gatherings. Now, you may recall uh, that we are in phase four of our uh, directed health measure. And in phase three, we had a 50% limitation on indoor venues. In this phase, we've had a 75% limitation on indoor venues. We are going to change that 75% to 50% the way it was in phase three. And this is in recognition, of, again, of the number of hospitalizations we have and the fact that we're going into a season where it's going to be cooler and there's going to be more events inside. So we're going to change that to a 50% uh, restriction on those indoor venues. Also, similar to what we had in phase three, we will have a limitation of eight per party or per group for those indoor venues. So that's our second change. Our third change has to do with bars and restaurants. Again, similar to what we had in phase three, we're going to put back in the requirement that if you're at a bar or restaurant, you must remain seated unless you are getting up to place your order, go to the restroom, or play one of the games that they may have in that bar or restaurant. So you have to remain seated. We're also going to limit table sizes to eight, and similar to what we had in phase three. So it'll be limited to eight. Uh, so that's our third change there. And then our fourth change has to do with weddings and funerals and those, uh, those venues. Uh, again, what we're going to do is limit the size of tables at wedding receptions, for example, to eight people. If you've got a larger group of that, that's going to have to be split up into two different groups, just like you would have at a restaurant as well. So limiting the size of each of those tables to eight. Now, that's the changes we're going to make in the directed health measures. So that is will uh, become effective on Wednesday, October 21st. And in, also with the upcoming Husker game on the 24th, that will mean that bars, again, everybody's going to have to have a seat at that, in that bar. You'll have to have a seat in that bar. You will not be able to have standing room only in your bars uh, to watch the Husker game. So just want to emphasize that. The second thing, and this is what uh, Dr. Anton will talk about, is going to be the program that we are using with the CARES Act money to be able to assist our hospitals in staffing. We're going to have up to $40 million in CARES Act money available that will be granted out to our hospital systems for them to be able to boost their staffing. Uh, and it will be for a variety of different types of staffing, and Dr. Anton will go into more detail with regard to how that will work, but that will be one of the ways that we can make sure that our hospital systems can continue to be able to provide the acute care for the folks who are coming to them. So that's kind of our second program. And third, we need to have a renewed emphasis on making sure we are slowing the spread of the virus. As I said, it is pain me to put these measures in place to, re to restrain personal liberty. However, it's important that we don't become like Italy and not be able to provide that care for people who show up at the hospital system. And while right now our hospital system has been able to accommodate the 323 people that we have in our hospital system, we have to look down the road to make sure that that does not get to the point where it becomes a problem. And that's why we need people to remember that when you are out in public, this disease spreads from one person to the next, right? And so our, we're going to have a campaign that we want people to remember three C's. Because this is where the virus is spreading, these three C's. It's through crowded places, confined spaces, and close contact. Right? Makes sense. It's a virus. If you're in a place with a lot of crowds, it has the opportunity to spread from one person to another. And we have seen that in cases like of a wedding, where we had a wedding where we had 200 guests and 30 people came down. Or you may have read the story uh, about the homecoming party uh, that was in the paper today. So crowded places. 
The second is those confined spaces. So again, this is where if you're in an enclosed space and there's poor ventilation and you're closer than six feet to somebody, you should be wearing a mask, right? That's wearing that mask does work. It is effective. And Dr. Lawler is going to talk a little bit about the importance of that as well as the data that wearing a mask works. So if you're going to be inside closer than six feet, wear that mask. The third thing is close contact. And that's when, again, closer to somebody than six feet for that 15 minutes. And this is, again, where we just have to be mindful. Uh, I told the story um, last week about four retirees who got together for coffee and then ended up giving it to each other and they to 12 other people. Uh, again, not necessarily a big group of four people, but close contact is what allowed that virus to spread. So these are the, the three C's we want people to remember to avoid these three C's, these crowded, uh, crowded places, confined spaces, and close contact, because that's what gives the virus the opportunity to spread, is those areas. So please, folks, we really have to have folks remember this and put it in practice, that if you're going to be in those places where the virus is likely to spread, if you're going to be closer than six feet to people, wear that mask. That's going to be important to slowing the spread of the virus. Now, this is important because we want to make sure that we're slowing the spread of the virus to preserve our hospital system, but also to protect our vulnerable communities, communities in particular our long-term care facilities, where people work in these long-term care facilities, if they're out in the public and they pick up the virus, then that's going to impact the ability of, of uh, folks who have loved ones in those facilities to go visit their loved ones. And of course, we've seen from other states how devastating this can be if the virus goes through a long-term care community. So we want to make sure that we're protecting our long-term care communities by limiting the spread, and that's what the three C's is going to be important about. So again, folks, uh, I know people are tired. It's painful. But we've got to have a renewed emphasis on making sure that we're following these rules to slow the spread of the virus. And that's why we're changing the DHM, we're assisting hospitals with staffing, and we've got this communication campaign for people to understand that they've got to avoid these three Cs. So with that, again, I'm going to, uh, in a moment here, call up Dr. James Lawler to talk a little bit about some of the data and some of the uh, importance of wearing masking because there's some uh, confusion out there with regard to whether they work or not. So Dr. Lawler is going to help us out with that. Then he'll be followed by Dr. Anton who will talk about our program for hospitals and staffing, followed by Gina Ewing who will talk about the public health directors and what they have been seeing. And then finally, Commissioner Bloom said about the schools. So with that, Dr. Lawler, I'll call you up. Thank you, Governor. So we've entered a dangerous phase in the pandemic for Nebraska. Um, as you can see from our State Department of Health and Human Services data, uh, we've reached levels of cases in our communities which are uh, in great excess of where we were at our previous peak in May. And unfortunately, we are still accelerating uh, in the number of cases we're seeing per day. In contrast to what we saw in May, where outbreaks were concentrated in urban areas uh, around the Omaha area and Lincoln, and also in communities that uh, had meatpacking plants and other um, congregate settings, uh, now the epidemic uh, is really widespread across the state and especially uh, is active in many rural areas of Nebraska. So uh, many of the rural counties in Nebraska have uh, rates of infection uh, in excess of 70 cases per 100,000 per day. To put that in context, that is well above the rates that New York City was seeing during its peak in early April. So this is a really serious situation, and as the governor uh, indicated, uh, we are certainly at risk uh, for our health systems becoming overwhelmed. We know that cases tend to lead hospitalizations and deaths by several weeks. And so what we see now today, we're not going to really feel the full effect of uh, for another three or four weeks. And so it's really important for all of us to buckle down at this point to take action to reduce transmission in the community. I think the good news is that 
as opposed to May, we now have a much better understanding of how the virus is transmitted and, and what we need to do to protect ourselves and protect our community. We know that this virus is transmitted through direct contact, through close contact where uh, respiratory secretions that um, can be produced in, in droplets by coughing or sneezing or even talking can transmit. But now I think we also know uh, more and more that this virus can be transmitted by aerosol, uh, which can happen over distance and uh, really depends a lot on uh, the concentration of virus, so how much volume of air it has to disperse in, how close you are to the person who's the source, and how long that contact is. And that's why uh, we know that these situations of close contact and confined spaces and crowds are especially uh, conducive to the spread of, of this virus. So we know now from, from studies that um, being in uh, a restaurant where there are uh, many people uh, without masks uh, and uh, in close congregation uh, carries significant risk. There are studies that show that people who frequented restaurants where people were not wearing masks had a seven to ten times the risk uh, of developing COVID as those who didn't. People who frequented events and venues where there were crowds of more than ten people. Uh, in one study, people who had been in those situations for seven times or more had almost 30 times the risk of COVID from those who did not attend those types of gatherings. So all of those situations where we have people uh, in crowded conditions in close contact, particularly indoors where you have a lower volume of air uh, in which the virus can diffuse and dilute, all of those uh, produce significant risk for transmission. We also know now that this virus tends to spread in, in clusters and spurts. So the majority of people who become infected probably won't transmit the virus to anybody. But a small proportion of people who are infected, maybe 10% or 20%, are responsible for the vast majority of cases. And, and that happens in these super spreading events quite frequently. And so those crowded conditions and, and crowds uh, create uh, an environment that's even more amenable or conducive to that type of spread. Finally, we know now that the virus is frequently transmitted by people who have absolutely no symptoms. Uh, especially young people can frequently have infection uh, and never develop symptoms. Uh, but that doesn't mean that these people are not a risk for transmission. So we know now that the virus can spread silently uh, in schools uh, or in uh, other crowded situations, or even in families. And because people don't develop symptoms, they never realize they're sick, they don't go and get tested. And so this creates a situation where the virus can spread dramatically across the community before we even know it's there. So for all of these reasons, adhering to the rules that the governor talked about are really Im important. And the last thing I want to talk about is the importance uh, of face masks. Uh, as I said, we, we know that the virus is transmitted from person to person by respiratory secretions, uh, particularly droplets and aerosols. And we know that wearing face masks reduces the chance of uh, a, an infected person as a source from disseminating the virus. It also protects the wearer. And studies show us that uh, people who consistently wear masks and populations who consistently wear masks have a significantly reduced risk of transmission. Um, three to five times in some of the studies that have looked at uh, face mask use uh, in, uh, in certain institutions. The other thing we now know is the experience of many hospitals that during the spring and summer implemented universal masking policies, including our hospital, uh, UNMC in Nebraska Medicine in Omaha. And what many of those hospitals have reported uh, is a dramatic reduction in staff infection rates once they implemented those policies of universal masking. So uh, again, the, the, the key is preventing spread from these folks who are without any symptom. Uh, and also protecting all of the, the, the staff members in that hospital uh, from that contact. And that, uh, that idea of everybody masking in the community is really a, a powerful tool, 
uh, along with all of these other provisions that we have to protect ourselves. So um, I know that there's uh, there's been a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, that's been broadcast about uh, masks, including a recent study from CDC where people pointed to the fact that 85% of people who had COVID were wearing masks. Well, that study was done in cities that all had uh, a mask mandate in place. So everybody in the city was wearing a mask. So of course, 85% uh, of people who had COVID uh, were going to be, uh, were going to report wearing a mask. What people don't tell you is that the, the single most important risk factor that they found when they compared people who had been infected with those who didn't uh, was attendance at restaurants where people were not masking. Um, so the real difference between the people who got COVID and those who didn't was that people who got COVID frequently went to restaurants and took off their masks in the presence of many other people who were taking off their masks and spending hours together eating. So that study actually demonstrated that masks are highly effective in, in preventing the transmission. So you, need, you really need to be careful the, the sources you're getting your information from and make sure that it's from uh, the direct source and a credible source uh, like uh, our public health experts uh, and not necessarily your, your friend on Twitter. Um, so I uh, want to make sure that we, uh, you know, adhere to these guidelines. Uh, you know, we wear face masks when we're out in public. Uh, and together, if we do all of these things, uh, we'll be able to reduce transmission uh, and protect the vulnerable folks in our uh, community who are uh, most at risk. Thanks. And so now I'm going to turn it over to our uh, state's chief medical officer, Dr. Uh, Gary Anton. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Lawler, for that lead in. As you can see from the chart that Dr. Lawler went over as far as our number of cases going up, this is something that everybody can see uh, every day on our dashboard at dhhs.ne.gov. And uh, we knew from Dr. Lawler gives a lot of updates on a daily or twice weekly basis that we knew hospitalizations were going to increase at some point in time, pretty much as he predicted, about four weeks after we saw the number of cases increasing, we knew that hospitalizations would begin to increase. So I'm here to talk about our plan on how we're gonna try to help the hospitals with staffing uh, during this time. So the department has been working alongside Governor Ricketts to maintain our hospital cap capacity throughout this pandemic, and as he mentions, almost all at all press briefings, I'm in communication with the hospital CMOs or CEOs on a daily basis to talk about their bed availability and their staff availability. And one thing I've been hearing as a common theme over the last several weeks is that we're doing okay for beds, but we need nurses and other staff to help staff those beds to maintain our hospital capacity. So we know that, we know, like Dr. Lawler said, we know a lot more about this virus. And one of the other things we know is how to treat it. We now know more that, that back in May, when we saw that first peak, that about 27% of patients that came into the hospital were gonna be placed on a ventilator. And now, yesterday, with 323 patients in the hospital, we only have 9% of patients on a ventilator. So that's probably a tribute to the great care that the providers are giving, but also to some of the treatments we have like dexamethasone, remdesivir, convalescent plasma, and BiPAP. A lot more patients are being placed on uh, to increase their oxygen levels on a mechanism called BiPAP rather than on the ventilator. And that, that does help quite a bit. As I, as I mentioned, as I talked to the hospital and they expressed this need for ad additional staffing, they were worried about what was gonna happen, not only now, but in the, in the upcoming winter months. We know how hard they've been working during this pandemic, all staff, nurses, down to the custodial staff. So as we need these hospitals to expand their capacity, we know that we're gonna to have to come to some decision about how we're gonna increase their staffing needs. So we've developed this plan to support the Nebraska hospitals specifically for their staffing needs. As you recall, Nebraska received approximately 1.25 billion, 
not approximately, I think exactly 1.25 billion in CARES Act money to aid in the coronavirus relief efforts. $166 million of that money went to the Douglas County and the remainder was left to be allocated by the state. Governor Ricketts initially outlined the main priorities for use of these funds, including supporting our community institutions and hospitals. The governor has now recently approved up to $40 million in this CARES Act money to support Nebraska hospitals in their staffing efforts. This will help maintain capacity as we are able to increase the number of beds that are staffed. This assistance will come in the form of grants to the statewide acute care and children's hospitals that have been taking care of our COVID patients during this time. Each hospital was asked to submit a proposal outlining its plan on how they would use these funds to increase their staffing capability and that's how we arrived at that dollar amount. So obviously we're gonna continue to monitor the hospital capacity and evaluate measures that might not even be needed to take in the future to help with our hospital needs. We at the state want to personally thank all the hospitals and all their staff for all their assistance and help in treating Nebraskans during this time. I personally witnessed it myself. I've gone to several hospitals, talked to several nurses, several physicians, several staff, and I know that how tired they're getting. So hopefully with these increase in the staffing needs, we'll be able to help that out. So uh, I want to turn it over now to Gina Ewing, who's right, the- Can you just talk about, a little bit about uh, how the hospitals might use this, the kind of things that- Yes, using? yeah, so governor asked me to just go over how the hospitals might be able to use this money. The first thing we thought they'd be able to do is to go out and start seeking what we call traveling staff, traveling nurses, traveling respiratory therapists, travelers, so to speak, to, to help get them up and oriented and then trained in those specific hospitals. And this is something that's not new. When I was working, we had a lot of travelers working in the operating room and the ICU as that capacity required. But uh, that will be one of the main reasons that we uh, provided these funds is to help with the travelers because obviously they, they cost a lot more than the regular nurses because you get them through travel, there's, or it's through staffing agencies. And then they'll be able to also use this, these funds to um, provide hazard pay to their existing staff so that maybe they will increase a work period or overtime period, or maybe work an extra shift during that week. And I know that probably is something that's not gonna last forever and then hopefully the travelers can help download that in the, in the near future. And this is, uh, again, even down to uh, screeners that you see when you go into the hospital. That's an extra hospital expense for them. So they'll be able to use those funds for all those specific needs. Um, I was gonna introduce uh, Gina Ewing, who's uh, our public health director of Elkhorn and Loken Valley. We have the head of the Nebraska Association for Public Health Directors here in our audience today, Susan Bachrath and we appreciate all her existence. Just so everybody knows, I've probably gone over this before, but Nebraska has 19 public health departments. Gina is one of the 19 directors of the public health departments, and you guys really can't believe how much of a role they played during this whole period of time. Probably one of the most critical roles, so I'll have Gina come up and speak a little bit about what they've been doing. Thank you, Dr. Antone. For years, my colleagues and I have been giving and receiving advice about what all of us can do to improve the health and safety of ourselves, such as being mindful of our weight, getting cancer screenings, wearing seat belts, and changing the batteries in our smoke detectors. All of the programs, education, and policies that we promote are based on science, the same science that we rely on for finding the right cancer treatments, for formulating the pill to lower our blood pressure or cholesterol, or for advancing our ability to improve outcomes of high-risk pregnancies. 
For decades, scientific evidence has guided our work with communities, businesses, schools, and individuals to help improve their personal health and to make the environment around us all healthier and safer. For example, in October, we observe Breast Cancer Awareness Month. In the spirit of the health and wellness, we encourage women to participate in breast cancer screening because scientific evidence tells us that early detection of breast cancer improves the likelihood of survival. The good news is that in the era of COVID, the science-based healthy choices we can make are fairly easy and they are 100% affordable. They include avoiding the three C's. On our poster here, we have crowded places, close contact, and confined spaces. And then if you have to participate in some of these activities, wear a mask and maintain six feet of distance between yourself and others. One of the most common um, questions that we receive is what can be done to keep schools open or businesses open or what can be done to keep our sports teams playing. Keeping all these activities going is a goal that we can all agree to rally behind and we <coughs> believe that accomplishing this goal is what's best for Nebraskans. Taking steps to achieve this goal is our shared responsibility, and after all, we are only as strong as our weakest link. We know that testing for COVID increases case counts. The case counts will likely go up, as we've seen in the in recent past. But positive tests alone are not what cause schools, businesses, and churches to shut down, and they are not what takes the team out of the game. What does create those closures is, excuse me, what does create those closures is our gatherings in, in these large groups. This leads to staffing shortages for businesses and for schools. It leads to so many students being out of the classroom on quarantine that instruction becomes inefficient. Schools are taking impressive steps to prevent exposures between kids while together at school, and those steps are working more often than not. But exposure at family-sponsored events and informal get-togethers like parties, sleepovers, car rides with friends, those can undermine the incredibly hard work that the teachers, principals, and superintendents have put in. We all need to make it a goal to keep our circle small. I invite everyone to be mindful of what your exposure list would look like should you become ill today and get a call from your local health department asking you to remember everyone that you had been in contact with for more than 15 minutes over the previous 48 hours. Would you be embarrassed by the length of your list? Would you regret if the person that you sat by at last night's game had to be out of work for two weeks or if their kids had to be out of school for two weeks. How would you feel if you were called by your health department and learned that your neighbor in the bleachers last night, who was feeling fine at the time, was COVID positive today, and now you have to miss your child's games for the next two weeks? So that you can feel good about what you have done to protect those who are on your contact list today and going forward, we ask you to avoid the three C's. Avoid crowded places, avoid close contact, and avoid confined spaces. If you cannot avoid the three C's, wear a mask over your nose and mouth, or keep six feet of distance from people you don't live with. It is the people around us, those who are closest to us, and those that we know and trust that are oftentimes exposing us. Parents, we need you to model avoiding the three C's and wearing your mask for your children, and we need you to require them to do the same. Business owners, we need you to set expectations for yourselves, your staff, and your customers to help all involved to avoid the three C's. And coaches, even those that volunteer, we need you to make the three C's a priority on and off the field or court. Over the past few weeks, health departments across the state have dealt with countless examples of preventable exposures to infected people, parties in garages, sleepovers, large and small dinner gatherings, birthday parties, carpools, crowded locker rooms, teams on buses, and teens piled in cars together. Will these exposed people recover if they become ill? The vast majority will. However, for every person exposed at these informal activities and casual get-togethers, that at the same time may lead to missing of work, 
one student missing school, a team short of a player, or one business without an employee. And these add up very quickly. And if the exposed people become symptomatic and go on to become COVID positive, the impact extends to those exposed people's entire households. One event or gathering, large or small, can quite easily close down a community, business, or school, or take down a sports team. Exposure to positive cases exponentially increases COVID-19's impact on Nebraskans. So again, we ask all Nebraskans to join us in avoiding the three C's. Avoid crowds, confined spaces, and when you can't be six feet apart, wear a mask. These actions are what make your contact list small, and these actions are what can prevent you from landing on someone else's contact list. Smaller contact lists keep enough teachers and students in school to keep the schools open. They keep enough workers at work to keep our businesses open, they keep enough community people healthy that our churches can stay open, and it keeps enough players healthy that our teams can continue to compete. Thanksgiving is coming in the not too distant future. It is very likely that we will, at, we will all have to be hosting smaller celebrations, and we will have a lot more leftovers than usual. For over 500 families in Nebraska, their gatherings will be smaller because they have lost a loved one due to the virus already. This disease is serious and it's real. The actions we take today will decide the fate of our schools, businesses, teams, and churches. Moreover, it will determine the number of additional Nebraskan families with an empty chair at their Thanksgiving table. Please avoid the three C's and please wear a mask or maintain six feet of distance everywhere you go. Thank you. And I would like to turn this over to Matt Bloomstead for a Department of Education update. And thank you, Gina. Um, what I have to add to is just watching our public health officials and the work that they're doing pretty much 24-7 is uh, extremely remarkable. And also remarkable, I think, at these points in time is how the schools have responded and the, the reality of that response has been actually quite good in formal settings, that we've done a pretty good job of, of seeing protocols take place that uh, generally, as we're looking across the state, seeing good, good practices, seeing mass Asking, seeing those things there, that's actually, those practices and protocols are keeping us uh, going. Um, however, uh, the data, as Dr. Lawler and the governor pointed out, and, and Dr. Antone as well, um, are, we're fighting an uphill battle, and it's literally uphill on, on the chart right now. It's an uphill battle in our schools because many of our school leaders and our teachers are having to help track and understand where students have been and what, have, what has happened. And as we see more and more community spread, it's going to be harder and harder harder to be able to maintain a safe school environment. And unfortunately, if we think we're doing a good job in, in schools, we know maybe we're not doing a great job in our communities um, and, and, and not taking it as seriously as we need to take this. Now, I, I have my, my second daughter, when, when I started this job, she was in fourth grade and she said to me, she goes, well, commissioner of education sounds like a really important job, but dad is all the more important. So I want to talk to parents just a little bit. As parents, we, we know our kids are enjoying this opportunity to be in schools. We know that this uh, is meaningful to them. We know as a society that our kids in schools are, are receiving the types of services that they need, that they're able to be around friends. Yes, we're giving up some things and sacrificing certain things. Yes, we should be wearing masks. Yes, that's a good idea. But the reality is that is so much better than the alternative that I think we all experienced when schools had to be completely shut down. And the reality for us, keeping these activities going is, is following these protocols, not just in school. Um, everything that we're learning in school, if that's working, and we think it is, we think it is working pretty well. But if that's working, we need to take those same practices, those same procedures to our private lives and into our social settings. And so these three C's are absolutely critical for us to be able to message in our communities, in our businesses, across every family, to know that in order to 
to keep schools open, that's going to be a critical part of this work. Now, I, I can tell you I'm worried as we go into the winter sports season. Um, basketball gyms and everyone who's been in basketball gyms see how they fill up. I think this new directed health measure is absolutely critical to start uh, signaling that these limited, um, limited public spaces are going to be critical to keep us going. It's also going to be critical for us to think about different strategies in schools that get this done. Parents, work with your schools. Schools, work with your public health officials. We can get through this winter, but it's going to be tougher than I think even I wanted, anyone wanted. I want kids in school almost more than anyone else in the state of Nebraska. But the fact of the matter is we are putting that at risk if we cannot slow overall the community spread. And I think it's really important work. I really appreciate the governor sponsoring these press conferences and keeping that message out there. I appreciate the other folks here today. But our work is serious. Our work in our schools is serious. And we need that coordination and cooperation across all sectors to make a real difference and keep our schools open. So Governor, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to all of our guests who are here. Uh, I want to just kind of emphasize a little bit what uh, Gina and the Commissioner were saying with regard to schools and making sure that we avoid the three C's here, because I do think our schools have done a tremendous job. I was just in Grand Island earlier today, and I know Dr. Grover's done a fantastic job in Grand Island with the public schools there. But when we're doing activities outside of school, we got to remember we got to continue to Watch the three C's. So, for example, if you're going to, say, a football game, that you still need to be spread out six feet, you know, family groups need to be spread out six feet from each other when they're in the stands, and that if you are going to the game, if a bunch of the young people are going to the game all in the same car, they should all mask up. If they're all going to go into a locker room, they all need to mask up. It's those close, confined places that they're going to spread the virus. So out of the field is less risky, but if they're all piling into a car or a bus or going into a locker room, it's not going to matter that they were outside having this activity if they then go into an enclosed, confined space and have the opportunity to spread the virus. Those, those young people are going to be quarantined at that point if they're not wearing masks. So we need to continue to remember those rules about masking up when you're going to be in these confined spaces to be able to make sure that our young people don't get quarantined and can continue to attend in the classroom because our teachers, uh, our superintendents, everybody is working very hard to make sure there's an environment where young people continue to, can continue to attend, attend school. So thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate it. So with that, we'll go ahead and questions and answers. I know we had at least one question ahead of time. Justin? So a question come in from Bill Hammer <clears throat> with 1011. Is there anything that's being done to speed up testing turnaround time? According to the state's oh. dashboard, Test Nebraska is currently averaging between four and four and a half days. Yeah, so Bill Richley, uh, Channel 1011, uh, talking about speeding up the test time for Test Nebraska. Absolutely. We are working. We've had some challenges with regard to the staffing and with regard to some of the machines there. Uh, it's probably still going to take a couple of weeks. Uh, we are getting caught up. We did bring staff from the Nebraska Public Health Lab. So I want to, first of all, thank the staff at the Nebraska Public Health Lab for giving up their weekend and coming in to help out with the Test Nebraska Lab to help them get caught up. Uh, it was taking about four days to get some of this turnaround. That's not our service level that we want. Uh, I do know that we are getting caught up and on Tuesday I believe 84% of the tests that came in Tuesday were turned around within 48 hours. So we are taking steps to beef up the staffing, looking at different ways we can improve the process on that. Um, and then we're also looking at other ways uh, <clears throat> to be able to continue to do testing as well. So yeah, we're definitely making changes to do that. And I actually did have one other uh, uh, question up here that I just now saw when uh, talking to Justin here. Um, Ashley Richardson from WWT uh, 6 News said, would you now consider a statewide mask mandate or a mandate in areas of other state most impacted by the uh, COVID-19? And again, folks, on this, we need to learn the rules on doing masking, okay? We're going to be doing this for the foreseeable future. Uh, Dr. Lawler and I were talking about vaccines. We had to turn on our vaccine plan uh, yesterday. But we're not expecting to have a vaccine available till really the end of the year earlier, or so more likely earlier next year. And think about the time it's going to take to get tens of millions, you know, over 100 million Americans vaccinated. It's a logistical thing. It's just going to take time. So we are going to be managing this for the foreseeable future. So everybody needs to learn the rules around wearing masks. Part of that is, again, why we're not mandating them is because we don't want to build the resistance to it. But as Dr. Lawler described, masks work. We want people to 
understand when they're supposed to use them, when you're going to be closer than six feet, and use them when you're going to be in those confined spaces, crowded places, or close contact. All right, so go ahead, Justin. I have another question that came in from Jeff Robb with the Omaha World Herald, and he wants to know, in light of what we announced on hospital capacities and the state's work to uh, make sure that that is sufficient, is the hospital nursing staffing available to be hired, given that other states also have demand for nursing? So Jeff Robb for the Omaha World Herald says, are the, is the staffing going to be out there available to be hired? And again, in our conversations with the leaders of the hospital systems, uh, they do believe that that's going to be possible to, to get these traveling nurses to come in and supplement what they're already doing with regard to their staffs. And you know, that's all the questions I have that have come in, uh, texted from All right, great. Questions from here in the room. So the question was, uh, how long will this DHM be in place, and would we take additional steps going forward if we felt that they, these were not being effective? Dr. Anton, what's the uh, expiration date on this current DHM? You know, I am not certain at this point how, how the expiration date is. Yeah, I think, I, th I think the expiration date is uh, at least a month. Justin, do you know right offhand? We'll have, to, we'll have to get that for you, get the exact, but generally we put them in for about a month at a time. And then, and absolutely, we're going to continue to reevaluate this. And if, if we feel like we need to take additional steps, we will definitely take additional steps. And this is, again, where we really need Nebraskans to continue to do the right thing. Step up and make sure you're avoiding the three C's. You know, avoid those uh, crowds, those confined spaces. Matt, do you have the answer that I'm looking for? November 30th. Okay, so it's going to go through November 30th, about a month. So effective October 24th through November 30th. Well, the DH, DHM. And then, uh, again, avoid the three Cs. Make sure you're masking up if you can't avoid the three Cs or if you're going to be within that six foot of somebody else. That's all ways that we can make sure that we don't have to take even more steps going forward. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, at this point in time, why don't we look at masking uh, herd immunity, protecting those uh, entities like nursing homes, like different places, you know, to make sure and, and boosting up that effort and allowing herd immunity to take place. What are the matrix if we do herd immunity? So the question was, uh, well, why don't we just do herd immunity and try to focus on the um, long-term care facilities and other vulnerable populations? The reason that that really doesn't work is because you can't separate out those long-term care facilities from the rest of um, our community, right? So the people who work in those facilities live in the community. And if there's widespread virus in the community, those folks are going to take it into the long-term care facility. Now, we are doing a lot more testing with regard to that. And the federal government uh, under President Trump has provided us a lot more ability to do that testing. However, that still doesn't, even if you test and, and really slow it once it gets there, that doesn't address the issue with regard to what may happen to the staffing at those those uh, long-term care facilities. So we really have to have a community-wide effort to be able to protect the long-term care facilities. We can't just say, you just can't isolate those and say, okay, we're going to just worry about that and not worry about the rest of it. It really is a, 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 an ecosystem, if you will, that we have to keep all together. And that's why we all have to do our part with regard to avoiding the three C's, wearing that mask when you're being closer than six feet, washing your hands often, all the things we've talked about, because we can't separate out the community from those long-term care facilities. Those facilities are in the community. Fred. Governor, what, what's the difference between mandating um, no more than eight people at a restaurant table on one hand and not mandating masks because you don't want to build up resistance on the other? Well, so the question was, now, what's the difference between saying having eight people at a table in a restaurant versus uh, asking people to use masks? The eight people at a table is pretty easy for us to be able to work with the restaurant association to be able to verify and make sure that they're doing. We need people to think about wearing masks everywhere they go, not just when they go to a restaurant, right? So, for example, if you're going to have friends over to your house, you all should be staying six feet away from each other. And if you're going to be closer than six feet away, you should be wearing a mask. That's inside your house, right? So the same rules apply to your house as they would apply anywhere else. That's why we need people to actually understand why they're doing what they're doing with regard to masks and understanding the tool, that's a tool for us to use and not just you know, following the direction when they go into a restaurant like with the eight-person eight rule. So it's a question of enforceability? Well, in, so the, enforceability is part of it, but it's really about we have to get people to understand that 
You have to learn how to use all of our tools. A master tool you can use anywhere, not just in a restaurant. Andrew. Well, again, when I was referencing that it, it, it's painful to, to limit people's personal liberty, that was true back in March as well. And we're making this based upon what we've said always is, is looking at the hospital capacity. When we're 40% higher than where we were before, and granted we're still under 10% of our overall hospital capacity being used for coronavirus patients, but as we see the increase in cases there, that's what's really, uh, increase in hospitalizations, that's what's really driving the changes to the DHM and the other steps that we're taking. In retrospect, was it a mistake to, did you loosen up too early, too much? So the question was, uh, was it a mistake to uh, loosen up too early, too much? And here's the deal. Uh, Nobody really knows how this, you know, knew what this virus was going to do. We took the steps to uh, loosen some of these restrictions. At the same time, we were going back into school. So, you know, there's a variety of different factors there. But we're continuing to manage it based upon the hospitalizations, and that's what we're going to have to continue to do. And again, this is not something that is going to be short term. We've got to continue to manage this for the foreseeable future, so we're going to continue to make steps. Uh, when Dr. Lawler and I were talking about this last March, he talked about the, the hammer and the dance. You know, we put the hammer down in the spring to really slow the spread of the virus. We know a lot more now. We've got a lot more resources. But we're dancing right now. We're, we're trying to find what is the appropriate response to be able to continue to provide that hospital care and manage all the other things that go along with, um, you know, the impacts of having uh, the restrictions that we have in place, you know, because we've seen that with regard to mental health issues. Uh, we look at uh, a reduced number of cancer screenings happening, immunizations, and so forth. These are all side effects to some of the restrictions we put on earlier. So we're trying to balance all these things off and strike that right balance. Andrew. Possibly, Dr. Anton might know this, but how many hospitals right now could not meet that 10% capacity that they had before? So, Dr. Anton, do you know how many uh, hospitals right now will not be able to make that 10% cushion? I'll have you come up and address that. Currently, uh, some of the hospitals in the CHI system might not be able to meet that ICU capacity, but it's, it will be able to be system-wide so they could transfer within systems to go ahead and meet that capacity if they needed to. Okay, I thought you said you couldn't transfer. You could, you can transfer within systems, within the CHI system. So say if Bergen Mercy had 9% ICU capacity, they could transfer some patients to the Emanuel Hospital. You just can't transfer patients that need to come into your hospital to another facility. To another hospital system? To another hospital system, yes. Could you, uh, could you give all, like, like consortiums, <laughs> you know what I mean, so, uh, so that you're in a system? I mean, you know, is there any, any I guess, wiggle room as far as what constitutes a system? Yeah, well, like the question from Andrew is what constitutes a hospital system? So the major systems here in Nebraska are University of Nebraska Medical Center System, the Methodist Health System, the CHI System, and the Bryan Health System. So there, there was talk about initially about uh, doing it by area, say like the Metropolitan Omaha area or the Douglas County area. And, um, you know, that's something we just thought it would be better to do by system rather than by area. Well, what's the logic? I mean, if St. E's is full, why not allow them to transfer patients to Brian in order? It's something that we can, uh, uh, Fred asked whether, why not just do it by area rather than by system. And it's something that we will consider maybe in the future, but for now we thought it was best just to keep it within systems. I think part of the also thing is, Jerry, you might want to talk about, we don't want to create an incentive for hospital systems to transfer patients from one system to another system. That's not common ownership to avoid, um, you know, or to, in order to keep doing collective surgeries. The governor just asked me to remind everyone that, yeah, we don't want to have them being transferred patients between systems so that one system will be able to do uh, elective surgeries and the other one would not. 
Yes, Andrew. Is there any thought of, um, you know, with, with the shortage of, of nurse travelers around there, is there any thought of, of bringing in the National Guard to maybe help backfill, you know, other um, other areas that are possibly non-medical areas that they could do in a hospital that take away maybe some of the skilled nursing um, uh, duties, I guess? So Andrew asks, uh, what about using the National Guard and maybe some of their medical staff or resources from the National Guard to come in and help staff those hospital systems? Um, my mom used to have a saying that's sort of like robbing Peter to pay Paul because a lot of those nurses in the National Guard are nurses in the hospital systems, so really it wouldn't be much of a trade-off. Dr. Anderson, I have a question here from Julie Anderson with the Omaha World Herald. She asks, how many of the state's hospitals will be eligible for the money for staffing? Right now, we the hospitals that the, oh, the question is how many of the hospitals now statewide will be able for this funding, and we have narrowed it down to the hospitals that have been helping us out since the beginning of this pandemic, that have taken COVID patients that have more than 40 beds, and that's now of 21 hospitals statewide. Yes. This is a question that came in from Charlie Brogy with KFOR. Uh, Charlie, heard the governor reference the vaccination plan that the state submitted. Is there any additional detail you can provide on that plan? So the, the plan went in today, as the governor mentioned, and uh, basically we had to say how we were going to get the reporting system done for the vaccine. As Dr. Lawler mentioned, this is something that is probably going to be a two-dose vaccine, so we have to make sure that people that get one vaccine gets the same vaccine four weeks later. So that's a tracking system. And then we had to prioritize who will be available for the first allocation. We call it a phase 1A distribution or allocation, and that will be to like healthcare workers, long-term care staff, uh, minority uh, communities with minorities, and um, uh, I think those are the main three right now that will be prioritized for the vaccination, phase 1A vaccination. And then as we get further on with uh, other vaccines coming in, then we'll start distributing uh, to community-wide. So well, just the minority communities, knowing that they have a higher risk of hospitalizations and of dying. That's why that was factored into that. Yeah, there's actually, I mean, out in Alliance, there has been some struggles. The local school board has really um, laid it down that they aren't going to enforce different mask requirements and provide access. And I know that, that the Panhandle uh, um, um, local health department is really trying to work and be there. We're watching that as well. Um, I just met yesterday with a group of uh, school board members asking, hey, look, um, we got to get to a level of compliance with those types of activities. Otherwise, we're going to have to step in and do a little bit more and say, and put some other requirements on the school. Um, we, we may have a couple other circumstances where you run into a few board members here or there, a few community members here or there, certainly even you know parents and otherwise. My main message is everywhere you have to actually get into a line and be able to do that. I think out, out in Alliance right now I'm concerned because I think they've seen some outbreaks there. It's really important that they pull that together and, and I guess my message will be there will have to be some type of formal uh, work to make sure that they're getting in alignment. Other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Again, folks, thank you very much for being here this afternoon to talk about the state's response. We're going to remind people, right, avoid the three C's, crowded places, confined spaces, close contact. Wear a mask if you're going to be within six feet of other people because that's going to slow the spread of the virus. This is vital for us to be able to preserve our hospital system. And it's not just about the people who are coronavirus patients, right? We're talking about a lot about coronavirus patients, but think about it. If a hospital runs out of space because they've got coronavirus patients, that may mean that that heart attack victim has to be directed to a different hospital. 
So this is not just about people who are getting coronavirus. This is about anybody who may need that acute care. We've got to preserve that hospital capacity for everybody. And that's why it's so important that we all take personal responsibility for following the rules with regard to slowing the spread of the virus. I know people are tired. I know they're, it's painful. But we must continue to do this to preserve our hospital capacity. So again, folks, thank you all very, very much. We will be having our next press briefing at 10 a.m. on Monday morning, and then another one on Tuesday afternoon at 1 p.m. And so we'll see you all back next week. Everybody have a good weekend. Remember, avoid the three C's, wear your mask when you're going to be closer than six feet, wash your hands often. Thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Francis. Thanks, Andrew. Excuse me? I didn't want to ask I'm going to say no comment, just emphasize how much I want the president to be reluctant. Okay. <laughs>